Welcome to Wide Angle this week. We have an extremely special guest joining us, uh, the former number two at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Jane Hall Lute, who's also worked with the United Nations on gender and sexual exploitation. But in a week where we've seen one of the deadliest uh, gun attacks in the United States in Las Vegas, very important guest to have on the show this week. Uh, Jane Lou, thanks very much for being on the show today. I understand you're with the private sector now in your new role, but uh, I want to talk about the attack that took place in Las Vegas in the United States this week. You've worked with the Homeland Security Department in, in America uh, for a significant period of time. Do you think there's any way America was prepared for what happened in Las Vegas this week? Well, thanks, thanks for having me. It's really always a pleasure to be back in India. Um, I find the dialogue rich and challenging, um, and I especially appreciate being with you today. I would say, on your question, you know, is the American public prepared for the largest uh, mass shooting in its history? No, you're never prepared uh, for the, this level of violence, and particularly violence that seems to be so inexplicable. Uh, law enforcement officials at the federal and local level are exploring every lead to see just what drove this individual to take so many lives. When news of the attack came in, the first thing a lot of people thought of was what took place in Orlando at the nightclub uh, a year and a half ago. That shooting was claimed by ISIS. There were links established between the shooter and the Islamic State. In this case, even though ISIS had claimed responsibility, I believe that the FBI has essentially ruled out any uh, association of the shooter with the Islamic State. So when you have an entire country's security machinery geared towards looking at terrorism, particularly the threat of terrorism from a particular group, is it sometimes uh, possible that, you know, signs that you should be looking for within also slip through the cracks, perhaps? No, that's a very fair question, but I think there's a false premise behind it. Um, in the United States, there are law enforcement officials in the FBI, in the Department of Homeland Security, certainly, but across the United States, there are 850,000 state and local law enforcement officials, and they're on watch for the crime in their community, for those individuals that, that might have a history of crime. Um, they know what's normal in their environments as well, and so they're not distracted by a preoccupation with terrorism. Mm. They are focused every single day on the security of their communities. So I think back to your basic point about the early claims, for example, that ISIS was behind this attack. One thing you know when you're dealing with a crisis like this, and sadly, um, all, all of us around yeah. the world have had many experiences uh, with something like this. But one of the things that you know is that the first report is always wrong. It's always wrong. And so what we look to, we look to our responsible, responsible government officials as well as the media uh, to be sober in its assessments, but to share what it knows when it has confidence uh, in the information it has. And yes, uh, the FBI, I believe today, has thoroughly ruled out any connection to ISIS. What we're seeing, and I think this sort of mirrors what we see in India and other, other countries in the world as well, but what we're seeing in the United States is an extreme polarization of ideologies. I mean, it's a political polarization at one level, which is manifesting itself in uh, polarization at a community level. So in India, you'd have religious polarization. Uh, in the United States, it's you know, the, the hard right and the liberals of the Democrats, perhaps, at different ends of, uh, of the pitch. Um, in the case, and I want to bring this back to Las Vegas in a sense, because this, this gentleman, Mr. Paddock, I mean, if you can call him a gentleman, who opened fire with 10 assault weapons in a hotel, it also feeds into this larger political debate because you have the gun lobbies and the NRA that are pitched on one side of the political spectrum uh, and not on the other. You have Democrat presidents who've talked about restricting uh, access to guns and, and gun control. The Republicans have their own positions, and then you have an incident like this. What does it do to the debate on gun control in America, an attack like this? Well, I really want to get to your, the heart of your question, which is really what's fueling this divide what, that's manifesting itself really around the world in a kind of social anger that has, we've seldom seen in our lifetime on this scale, certainly. You're right, in the United States, politics are roughly evenly divided, 51% in favor of this, 49 opposed, vice versa. The numbers are really very close. This is the kind of political environment that really compels no particular policy and permits any policy. Hmm. Because the, 
the forces are nearly evenly divided, whatever narrative you put around it, whether you put a religious narrative around it or a political narrative around it or an ethnic or any other kind of economic narrative. What's very clear is what's happening is that many people feel as though if they're on the losing side of an election or a debate, that they're screwed. They feel like losers are screwed. And so we really have to get out of that kind of po poison politics. Hmm. And the only way that I know that we can is for winners to be generous, to say that, yes, all voices can be heard, all views can be taken account. Hmm. One of the things that's fed into this sort of divide, for want of a better word, is the way we have seen people voice their opinions in the most aggressive tones possible on social media. Um, you've also been looking at uh, the cyberspace and cyber terrorism and things like that. Um, the platform, when we look at counter, counter narratives on social media, for example, you, you, you make maybe a false assumption that if somebody is engaging in aggressive and violent speech, could that lead to something more radical uh, outside? But I think there are two questions really in, in what I'm trying to ask you. One is, when we interact face to face, there is at least a pretense of civility. That civility seems to have taken an absolute backseat when we're interacting in cyberspace. And the second is, should this kind of speech be countered, shut down, uh, what are the ways to discourage it uh, online? Boy, what, that's a really a very tough question that really speaks to the heart of what a democracy means. Hmm. So let's take them in turn. I think what's happened online is that we feel quite safe in the distance that we have from the people we're communicating with. And so there's less accountability. You can say things. Uh, you can portray things in, without really having to answer immediately for, for what you're doing, unlike in the physical world, hmm. where if, if you if you get into a fight and, and there's immediate consequences to that. I mean, with not only to yourself and to your opponent, but to others around you. And there are opportunities for intervention. We're sort of learning the internet as we're encountering it and as it's growing organically and instantaneously around the world. So the good side of this technology is that it really has empowered so much of the world's population. And it has allowed us to deminiaturize ourselves. Hmm. We're no longer forced into boxes that other members of society or our governments want to force us into. We can be whoever it is we want to be. Hmm. But there are consequences to that, as you rightly point out. You know, we're in favor our, in our two democracies of free and open speech. Right. That doesn't mean unfettered speech. It doesn't mean that all speech is protected. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater, for example. That's not protected speech. But we really need a dialogue in, as a society and as members of a society with, our, with each other and with our government about under what conditions will we say enough. This is poisonous hate speech. Many places have done so. India, for example, even in the United States. This is poisonous hate speech that incites people to violent acts and we, were say, we will say enough. Hmm. There are two components to this actually. One is of course hate speech that individuals are spewing out there with impunity. Uh, the other is in India what uh, what we call fake news I think in the U United States as well is, is the sort of gathering of information about individuals and their preferences and political choices which are being manipulated so and, and this takes me to, a, to you know a kind of follow-up question how do you without without compromising on the fundamental principles of freedom of speech how do you put in place uh, regulations or controls or consequences, for want of a better word, when things like this happen. And it's happening with, with an alarming pace, uh, even in India, on Twitter, on Facebook, for example. Everywhere. Everywhere. You know, you're exactly yeah. right. Well, there are a number of mechanisms that we have right, to deal with this. One is the regulatory legislation uh, mechanism. What role should government play in this? And how far should our rules go to counteract what we think are dangers now and, and help but at the same time not go too far to impose on our freedoms that we really cherish and value so highly. Another mechanism is the marketplace. Um, it's a weaker mechanism as we've seen in this area. We think, well, the market will reward good ideas, good reporting, good media. Hmm. And as we've seen, that's not necessarily the case. Right. There's quite popular um, outlets, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or other places, that, that spew forth hatred and vitriol. 
but they're quite popular. Why is that? Is it the sensational aspect of it or do people feel attracted to the message? So we need to look at these intersection of things. And then we as society have fundamentally to make some choices about what we believe we want to preserve and hold dear and how will we guard against threats to that. Hmm. When, when this conversation comes up and it seems to actually be a daily conversation, I, certainly all around, uh, you know, in Delhi for sure. But the argument always is when you see something on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or Google or whatever have you, you know, they're just platforms. They're not actually providing the content. They're not creating the content. The content is either being created by individuals or mainstream news outlets, for example. Mainstream news outlets, for better or worse, have some set of editorial guidelines and regulatory principles in place and are accountable for what they put out in their name. If you have these platforms essentially say, we're not responsible for the content, where do you even start the battle? Yeah, what, I mean, you're framing it beautifully. I mean, these really are some of the core questions that we have to contend with. One of the other things that the established media has, whether it's print or radio or television, is a level of maturity hmm. of conveying messages, of interacting with publics and interacting with the economics of providing the news or entertainment and, and have acquired this, this uh, understanding and I, I don't know if I'm going to call it wisdom, but certainly this experience, uh, which frankly does not yet exist in social media. And you're quite right. The platforms of social media um, are not in many cases stepping up to the responsibilities that, that most of society think they should have as platforms and purveyors of this news and of this information that's reaching all of our ears. You know, I have a young daughter um, who just became a teenager and she has older sisters in their 20s and none of them interact. I mean, there's really a quite a big generational gap between how I and my husband interact with the media, how our 20 year olds and 30 year olds and then how our young teenager interacts. And um, it's really quite interesting to see the evolution of the acceptability or not of certain things. Hmm. Even already in our youngest daughter, there is some maturing going on perhaps because of the volume, intensity, and constant nature of engagement. And I do note that there are a lot of teenagers particularly, or you know, young adults entering college in their first and second years of undergraduate school, who, who pri use the social media as their primary source of information. So even mainstream media outlets have their own Facebook pages and Twitter handles and things like that. Ultimately, they're not getting it by going to the website or the Twitter handle of that institution. They're getting it through their news feeds. And that does, to me, indicate that there needs to be a greater responsibility on these platforms somewhere. Well, I also think there's, there needs to be a fundamental reckoning by established media. Hmm. Um, we're living in an age where people are asking themselves, why, why should I? Uh, believe what I read in the Times of India? Why should I b believe what the New York Times say? Why should I believe the Washington Post right. or CNN or Fox News? And established media has sort of taken for granted that, well, of course you should we're believe right. us. We're right, yeah. Of you know, of course our, our motives are pure. Of course we're giving you the full story as we see it, the unvarnished truth. And I think they really, these platforms, not the social media platforms, but established media needs to go back and re-tell the story of the purpose of a free media in democracies and the role that they play and how they do their business. So people can begin to have confidence again and, and seek out, seek these sources out, um, particularly in troubling times. So I, I want to just, using the discourse on social media, I want to turn your attention to something you were working with in the United Nations, which is on gender and sexual exploitation. In this part of the world, in the last month, uh, six weeks or so, uh, when we've seen the exodus of Rohingya refugees from uh, Myanmar, Burma. Um, there's been, again, polarization on this issue. They're predominantly Muslim. Should India take in refugees as the largest country in the neighborhood? Uh, and while the sort of human rights aspects of those responsibilities are being debated, there is a view, and this comes out a lot on Facebook, uh, that, oh, you know, they're Muslims and just sort of a mass incitement of violence against these people as well. Some of the posts, I, I, I cannot repeat them. They're hateful, they're abusive, they're violent, they're inciting violence. The BBC has just done a whole series of stories from Cox's Bazaar and places where these refugees have been placed of women being mass gang raped. Now, 
these are issues that are at the intersection of gender, of sexual violence, of national security, of human rights, of Islam and extremism. How do, how do states encourage people not to be so divisive about things like this? Yeah, you know, this, uh, um, you know, it, one can, can, I think, uh, despair sometimes over the complexity and the depth uh, of the problems that we face. But I remain optimistic because I believe in the fundamental goodness of human nature and in the wisdom of our communities that have grown up through very difficult times and grappled with very, very difficult issues. So let me try and take this in pieces. Yeah. Um, one of the things we realized in the trying to address the problem of sexual exploitation and abuse in the United Nations is the fundamental recognition that there's nowhere women are safe. There's not a family, a church, a school, an organization, an office, a workplace, not a family, school, church, nowhere where women have not had to deal with this issue. And that's a stunning thing to say about the world we live in. Everywhere, women are encountering unwanted remarks, unwanted advances, and as you described, really the, the most horrific worst. What can we do about it? It does not have to be so. We need to value our girl babies as much as our boy babies. We need to create the tools so women can defend themselves and that men can defend women against this kind of behavior as well. We need to join together. So it's not a case, we think, that, that there is some island of tranquility that women can go to and be safe. So we have to find best practice and best examples everywhere. We have to raise our voices and say, this is not acceptable. And those who perpetrate these acts will be held accountable. Secretary General has made that very clear in the United Nations. And now, overwhelmingly, uh, if you work for the United Nations, you know about the problem of sexual exploitation and abuse and your responsibility to stand up against it. So we're trying to work with others. Secretary General has called on leaders around the world to join him in this fight. Hmm. And any messages that you have for, for Indians who will be also watching this video online, not just the international audiences, because as, as I said, these are challenges and battles that are being waged on a daily basis in India as well. And while there are lots of heartening stories of, you know, communities getting together uh, in the face of polarization, whether it is on Kashmir, on gender conflict, on uh, food preferences people may or may not have with the beef ban and mob lynchings and things like that. Ultimately, I like what you said about the fact that you're fundamentally an optimist and you believe that there is goodness in people that will come about. What do you think our politicians can now do to encourage people to find that goodness within? Because it's almost as though when you see leaders tweeting about certain issues, it's almost as though you see them encouraging what's mean and nasty about people. And how do you make that shift? Yeah, I, I do believe in the fundamental goodness of human beings. And I also believe that our politicians need to rise to this moment. Um, as we said, we were speaking earlier, you know, we're in a death spiral in our politics all around the world, where people feel as if, if they're not on the winning side, that they are, will be handed a raw deal. And so I don't think there's any wand waving here. There's no swish and flick and the problems are solved. These are very difficult problems. We have to band together. No individual or organization can do all that needs doing. Mm -hmm. All that needs doing can't be done alone. And we need to really express a better generosity of spirit. Winners must be generous. Those in, in high political office need to be generous in the way they narrate what's going on. They need to be definitive in what they're standing up against. But we also all want to join together um, and stand up for what we're for. Jane Lu, thanks very much for giving us some of your time on Wide Angle. Thank My you pleasure. very much. Thank you for having me.